Leslie, you're on mute. You need to undo the little um, microphone up near the leave button. Up the top where the share button was, there's a mic next to it. You just need to press that and it'll turn you on. Microphone. Okay, yeah, now we it. should be right. All right. Now I'll go back to, I think, okay, now I should be there. Okay, we, we, are, we are audible, are we? I'm audible now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to talk about what's been for me a lifelong passion. Um, I've been able to indulge my passion on fireflies uh, for all of my adult life through my research. I studied at Queensland Uni in what was then the Department of Entomology and one of the species I was studying when I very first began is the one you're seeing now around Kyogle. I'm long retired but I maintain an affiliation with Charles Sturt University. Um, and there are, I also um, have been responsible, partly responsible for setting up a Facebook page as well. Somebody my age doesn't work really well with Facebook, but we, we're doing quite well because of the other person who set it up knows what she's doing. Um, and I um, also maintain a web page. And if you're interested in looking at this web page, it is designed more for people who want to become, uh, to work on fireflies, but there's a section on Australian fireflies and there's pictures and descriptions of them all. Now, I'm going to make a, a couple of um, excuses, I suppose. I'm going to use terminology that you have not encountered before, you may not have encountered before, but I'm going to try to make sure that I explain them all, either as I go or somewhere else in this talk. I don't think there's any point in trying to explain what all the terms are to start with. It'd probably bore you all to ter terribly. Um, and also acknowledgements. I'm using a lot of pictures that have already been up on our websites, either our face Facebook Fireflies of Australia or the your own Kyogle Fireflies. And um, I, if I have made mistakes and I haven't acknowledged you appropriately, please just let me know and I can um, make some uh, alterations. Now, this is, if I deal with nothing else this afternoon, then this slide illustrates the most important piece of information I think I can give you. You're unique thus far in our community of Firefly Watchers as you're a local community who will be able to achieve things and, and I hope show the rest of us how to do it. Well, what sort of things do we need to know? Well, we, identifying the species, I think that gets a tick. We've been doing that, haven't we? Um, that's ongoing. Um, establish just what areas house populations of fireflies. Well, that's that's really uh, been going extremely well in Kyogle as far as the places where we find them. The most important part, of course, is what happens next, what should happen next. Once I finish this talk, I hope you'll be a bit better informed about what is necessary. If we're going to see those populations again next year and the the year after and the year after that, then we need to conserve the habitats where they are. You want to know that you can return to these pages again next year and see the fireflies again. That's your strength as a community and a local group in contrast to the much wider reach of the Fireflies of Australia group because you, as a local group, will know where they are. You'll find out who to approach. Is it um, sufficient, for example, that we just erect a sign in certain areas saying, Fireflies are breeding here, and, and please maybe don't cut the grass or um, don't use pesticides. Can you approach locals who have fireflies on their own properties and advocate for their conservation? I think that might be happening already. What local gov like government authorities might you be able to help? You are the ones that are going to lead the way. You're the ones that are going to show us. That's why I, th I think that your localised Firefly group is just so very important and I wait, eagerly await to see what happens next. Now, maybe tonight, maybe tonight, you're going to go out and, and observe a local population. And like everybody else, you'll be mesmerised by that wonderful display. But I wonder, do you know just what else is going on there, right in front of your eyes or in the leaf litter at your feet and you may not really be aware of it. Well, it's a mating dance with adult males and females focused on just one thing. It's a very high stakes game. Most of the males will die of unrequited love. 
having never found a female. Most of the males you see will never, ever find the female. The weapon of choice for both sexes is light, but there are fireflies that rely on, on perfume. We don't have any of them in Australia, but if there are actually fireflies that don't produce light and they have to rely on pheromones or perfume to attract the sexes. At your feet are gluttonous larvae, gluttonous cannibals, which are actually consuming their prey alive at your feet as you stand there watching the males. Everywhere there's a form of chemical warfare. After all, if you must fly around advertising your position in such a flagrant manner, then you have to expect that something will try to eat you. There are different stages for different jobs. I call them avatars, but I was just getting a little bit posh there. And then it's a bit of a case of find the female. All those males are incredibly frustrated in trying to find a female. So you see if you can find a female too, and then you might understand. If you go into a supermarket, let's say it's Woolies, and you find that they employ a, a type of classification scheme for their produce. That's all right if you're in the aisles. You just don't look, as we know, you just don't look at the ends of the aisles because that's not a classification scheme at all. Um, all the soup will be in the one place. Everything you need to cook with is all going to be in the one place. Um, it makes things easier for us to find things there. And we have, and biologists have a classification scheme too. It's, it helps us to know what we're looking at. It also is, of course, based on how these things have evolved. And if we want to sort of say, well, what are fireflies? Well, fireflies are insects, first of all. They belong to a class insecta. And I suppose everybody knows at some stage or other they picked up that insects have three pairs of legs. Within that class, there are subdivisions. So within the class insecta are a whole lot of orders. The order Coleoptera are the beetles. And the firefly is a beetle. It's not a fly at all. Um, the highlighting that I've put, I've used there is to show you the level of classification. Um, the level, level of classification often relates to how the word ends, so that the fact that the orders end in P-T-E-R-A tells you exactly what level of classification you're using. The word coleoptera is composed of two parts. The, uh, those of us who are biologists sometimes have to know a little bit of Latin um, I don't know any Greek, but um, Latin sometimes helps to work out what some of these words mean. The coleos part means a sheath and refers to the front wings of beetles, which we will look at in the very next slide. And the PTERA bit means a wing. So this word, coleoptera, is actually just saying that these, whoops, are the sheath wings among the insects. And if the further we go, Orders are divided into families. Note the ending of the word that tells you that it's a family. I-D-A-E means that it's a family. Lampyridae, pretty good name for fireflies because it's a lamp. Um, and they're, even within the, the family, there are also subfamilies. Now, I will only be mentioning this again right at the very end, but the subfamily Lucialini, I-N-A-E for subfamily endings, is quite important because it's the only subfamily we've got. And this is Atafella scintillans. And if you haven't recognised it up close, well, that's what you're seeing at the moment. Lovely, lovely looking specimen. Why are they beetles? What makes them a beetle? Well, look at the front wings of this firefly. Once again, this is Atafella scintillans, the same specimen that you're, the same species that you're looking at at the moment. And look at the front wings. The front wings act as covers for the rest of the body. But when the insect flies, what it does with those wings, which we call them elytra, they're larger than the, the, um, the sorry, the elytra are raised up to the side of the body and then the hind wings are expanded. So I'm not sure whether you can see this, but I'll try and show this. This, this is the front wing and here is the hind wing. The hind wing is the flight wing and it's much larger than the front wing. Now, if you think about this aerodynamically, this is an absolute disaster. Um, I'm sure that, I, I think you've probably all seen Christmas beetles at some stage or other. 
um, in December coming into um, light. They're very noisy, very erratic flight. And the ones I, I have ever seen just seem to bump into everything under the sun. So our fireflies, they're not really very strong flyers because they're flying with this hind wing. They've got to do something with this protective front wing and they have it stuck out um, in front of them. So it, it, they just don't have anywhere else to put it. Um, at the foot of this slide is a little bit about how I'm going to use the names that we're going to be dealing with. Um, every species like the one you're seeing now has two proper names. The first is Atafella. Atafella scintillans is a scientific name. Atafella is the genus and it's the generic name. And when it, within a genus, there can be one to many species. And scintillans is the species and the specific name for this particular. Um, they, they, tend, they tend to be written in a certain way. So Atafella always will have a capital A and scintillans has a lowercase. It's all in lowercase. There's the same thing. And why are they... Fireflies, why do we call them fireflies? Because they produce light. So the, this is a beautiful shot. Again, you can see the front wings expanded, the hind wings, which are so much bigger than the front wings. So they do have a bit of a, a job actually folding them up to fit them underneath those front wings. But that those beautiful two segments right at the end of the abdomen, which um, my screen seemed to want to go faster than I want to go. Um, and this. This is this is it. This is Atafella scintillans, and there are the, are the males. So you can see a male there lying on its back with its light organ, and look at the female. The female is flightless. One of the reasons why you don't see that many of them, and I just pose a question right now, because if this is a flightless female, then how does this species disperse? She can't fly. That's all she's there for is to mate and lay eggs. She can't fly. These are some of the pictures um, that uh, just been recently taken within the last couple of the within the last few days, actually. And um, these are this is a living female. And a few of the features that you need to notice about it is that she's got for, for someone, for, a, for a, an insect that relies on being able to spot her male of choice, she has very small eyes. She has very short elytra. She doesn't have any hind wings. And effectively, she's a, a big, fleshy, yellow bag full of eggs. The specimen on the left-hand side at the bottom um, is a, a dried museum specimen so that you can see that when you do actually get a fresh living specimen like this, I, I get tend to get extremely excited about that. Now, how, how do the males interact with her? Um, this dance that you're seeing out there at night, it, the, it's all the males. The males are flying around, flashing like crazy, trying to see a female down on the ground somewhere. Um, so you don't see many females. There are very few females in collections, which is probably just all to the good because we want them to be there and lay their eggs. So what she does is she, she'll climb up grass stalks or rock edges. Uh, she can't climb very far. She's too heavy. She's, she's not a very agile individual at all. And she puts her head uppermost so at least she can look up to the sky and there's an absolute smorgasbord of males up above there. So she assesses them. What does she choose? We don't really know. But, you know, if, if it's a matter of they're all flashing like crazy, it's something to do with the flash, the strength of the flash, the duration of the flash. How do we know? Now, we know that in some fireflies, there's a very specific time lapse between the flash of the, cho the chosen male and the timing of her response. So if she's seen a male that she likes, she will respond and at a very precise time interval after he made his flash. And, and that means, oh, you lucky guy, you're, you're the chosen individual. And so he flies down and tries to find her. At this stage, she turns her light off, of course, and, and she's just waiting for him. There's then will be a little bit of interaction between the two of them as they are walking around on the ground trying to find them. 
uh, find each other and, you know, a little bit of flash, flash on, flash off, um, and ultimately they will, they usually find each other and they make, and there's been success for that particular interaction. Of course, what happens is that other males will see this interaction as well and they try to get involved and it all gets rather messy because those males will mate with anything they see. And the males often will, if there are a number of males coming down towards the female, they'll try to make mate with each other as well. So you've got this problem where you, we don't see females too often. That doesn't mean that there aren't, there aren't probably just as many females there as males, but we just don't see them because once she's mated, she's she's going to be doing something else. She needs to lay her eggs. So if we just recap for the minute, what you're seeing, what you will see if you go out tonight in Kyogle is just a very energetic dance, but it's males. The only one dancing are the males. If you find the female, um, yeah, well, you try it too. It's It's just not very easy at all to find females. The choice was light, not perfume. Um, uh, you see all of the males, all the males that you see there are the ones which are unsuccessful. That's most of them. They are going to die of unrequited love. And the next generation is already on the way. So the females, here we go again, the females have, um, as soon as they're mating, they lay their eggs and those eggs are going to hatch. So just be careful where you step because those very first stages of those very young larvae are very, very susceptible. And remember that in another week or two when the males are gone, the rest of the life cycle of this firefly is still there. And we talk about life cycle. We're not used to thinking about life cycle for us because when we are born, we look like you know, we know that we're obviously human and um, we're going to stay that way. But the life cycle within a, a, an insect, there are very different stages for different purposes. I think I, I call them avatars just simply because I was trying to be a bit smart. But what happens is from the egg hatches a larva. The larva is by far the longest stage. If you think that this life cycle looks a little bit familiar, Yes, it is. Uh, it's This is the same sort of life cycle that you find in a um, butterfly. So very long stage when, when it is the larva. And then we get pupa, which um, pupa allows the transformation from the larva to the adult. And the adult stage and the amount of time I've, I've indicated on here is sort of try, trying to indicate to you that the adults aren't are around for very long, even though we... We name things on the basis of the adult stage. We recognise them on the basis of the adult stage. For the other mm, largest part of two years in this life cycle, it is possible that they are just um, they're, they're larvae that you don't see. Now, there's some things that points that are made there. Um, fireflies spend most of their time as larvae, and we need to be we need to understand that because. That's what you're trying to conserve is the larval habitat. That the factors affecting the larva will determine the success or otherwise of this life cycle. Well, maybe not entirely if a fire comes through or we have an incredibly dry summer, but mostly if the larva will if the larva survives, the species survives. And the larvae feed on snails and slugs. Sometimes they might feed on small earthworms. And the thing about this is that sna sm snails, slugs, small earthworms normally live in moist undergrowth and leaf litter on the forest floor. So that the characteristic of a firefly habitat is that it will be moist. These are some larvae. This is actually Atafella scintillans larva. That color pattern is helping the larva to blend into its background. You'll notice that it looks absolutely nothing like the adult. Um, the specimen um, on the bottom right is showing you its small light organs in the last second last segment of the body. They don't flash this light, but they do turn it on and off every now and then, sorry. So um, 
we will be talking about that soon. For the most part, what this color pattern is doing is it's enabling this lava to remain concealed, that if there are things trying to eat it, then they're not going to be able to see it. This, okay, this is um, not Atafella Cinderlands, this is Atafella Flamands, which is from North Queensland. And I just happen to have these pictures, um, which I got from my naturalist because it's very seldom that you see a, a, such good pictures of a larva walking along. You can see that with the top picture that the larva has three pairs of legs, but it's what happens at the tail end of the body that's the really interesting thing. It actually has a series of filaments that come just from the very tip of the body at the very tail end. They are called, sorry about this, I don't know why they're still wanting to do that. Um, they're called pygopodia. The pygo just means rump, the, the tail end, if you like, and the pod, P-O-D or P-O-D-I-A, means legs. And these are eversible filaments, so it can push them out using um, fluid pressure, and the filaments are like the fingers of a glove, and the filaments have a whole series of recurved hooks around them so that if you are trying to attach yourself onto a snail shell, then you can evert these pygopodia they, they're terrific for attaching yourself on when you're trying to do something else with the snail. Hang on. Okay, it's the larvae which are the gluttonous, the gluttonous um, cannibals, if you like. And I, I've said here it's a bit like an the larvae are a bit like an alimentary canal on on legs. And and I'm sure that if you ever tried to keep anything like um, silkworms, then you know, that's all they do. It just goes in one end, out the other. They, they, they just eat. And that, that's the whole thing about larvae. How do they actually feed? Well, what they do with their prey, let's, let's, let's say that they're trying to feed on a snail. So they nip repeatedly at their prey with their jaws. I'm going to show you what the jaw, I'll, I'll come down to these pictures in a minute and show you exactly what these jaws look like. Each nip, they inject a little bit of salary, salivary enzymes, but also some midgut secretions. And, and every time the, sna the snail is bitten, it will retreat back into its shell. And unfortunately, the, the snail, when it um, thinks it's safe again, comes out again and gets bitten again. So, back, so there's this constant sort of going back into the shell, coming out, getting bitten, going back into the shell until eventually... It can't move anymore. The snail becomes paralyzed and it is then out of the shell. And what happens is that the larva moves in and starts to feed on liquefied living prey. It's injecting so much of its digestive enzymes and salivary, secre salivary secretions into the um, snail that it is actually um, liquefying its prey and the snail is still alive. Now, if you look at these pictures, this is on the left-hand side. This is actually what a head of a larva looks like. There are some, I get this, some small eyes, very small eyes on either side. It doesn't really need large eyes. It has a pair of antennae on either side here. But here are the jaws. We call them mandibles, same as our lower jaw, effectively but they're very slender and very pointed. This picture in the middle is a scanning electron microscope picture, but you can see the, the jaws again. Elongate, slender, very apically pointed. And on the right-hand side, this is all the same species. It's the Genji firefly from Japan. I apologize that it's not an Australian one, but I didn't have any decent pictures of our, our own ones. And this, with this one, you can see exactly this is just one jaw and what runs down the middle of that jaw and opens just behind that pointed tip is a canal. And that's where the way in which they can inject into uh, their prey their salivary enzymes, digestive juices. Once the prey, once the material is liquefied, they quite literally don't, they don't suck it up through this same canal anymore. 
they, they've got a lot of hairs around their mouth and they quite literally can just slurp it. Now, we talked about chemical warfare as well. And you may wonder why a firefly, which is because of the, the colour pattern it's got, is, is effectively trying to, to evade capture, would be foolish enough to turn its light on every now and then. Well, I'm sure you're, you're aware that some insects are often very distasteful to their predators. Their, their predators can learn to associate the bad taste with the insect, but that insect has to have some sort of distinctive coloration. It's often orange and black. There's no point in being having a dreadful taste if you don't advertise the fact. And what I've done is I put a couple of species here on the left, is Australo luciola flavicollis. It's one of the fireflies that we will be seeing in southeast Queensland. And the other one, again, we'll see it in southeast Queensland too, which is Australo luciola nigra. And they have, um, they're probably distasteful because they have this bright colour pattern of very dark brown, almost black elytra, and the front part of the body is, is orange. So now, look at the firefly larva with its light on, It, what's it doing with the light? It's actually advertising. It's not being foolish. It doesn't turn the light on all the time. But if something else comes along, a predator comes along and eats one of these larvae or starts to eat one of these larvae and discovers that they taste disgusting, and they, they really do apparently for predators taste disgusting, then it will learn to associate the light with the, um, the dreadful taste. This doesn't mean that all larvae will escape, but some of them, some of them will. The species will survive because of this. Now, the other thing is that it is possible to see larvae in the leaf litter at night because every now and then they turn their, their light on. So if you're looking at the soil, don't, try not to walk through the leaf litter. If you're looking at the soil, um, you may well see this light, the little, little pinpoint of light, not, not flashing on and off, just a little pinpoint of light. The phenomenon is called aposomatism. Um, that's chemical warfare. Okay, this is the final stage in the life cycle. And once again, I, for some reason or other, I don't have good pictures of what um, for our own species. And this is a, a species from Hong Kong that I've worked on too. And this, this is, for me, this is the most amazing stage of the life cycle of, of all, because what we've got on one stage, one side is we've got the larva, the alimentary canal on legs, if you like, um, that doesn't have any, that can't reproduce sexually, it doesn't have sex organs, it doesn't have wings, it just feeds and that's all. And on the other side of this, we've got the adult, which has wings, can fly, has is sexually uh, a sexually reproductive organ um, has sex organs, but maybe doesn't feed, and somehow you've got to be able to turn one sorry one into the other, and that's what the pupil stage is for. The pupil stage is the most amazing stage in the life cycle, in that basically everything is almost melted down and reassembled again. In the the larval larval tissues are melted down and then reassemble in the adult form. Now, we know that male fireflies produce light. The patterns of light production can be used to recognize the species. We don't have enough information on that to do that yet with Australian species, but because we, we don't have all that many species, we are almost never in a situation where we need to rely on flashing patterns. But if you have a look at the graph on the right, and this is about as complicated as we're going to get in this talk. Along the x-axis, this is a, a, a species I've worked on from China, and along the x-axis, there's um, the time in seconds, and along the y-axis, up the y-axis, is the intensity of the flash. And if you look at it, this firefly is actually turning a light on every three to four seconds for just over a second. You can see from the graph that the intensity is, is variable. Let's go back again. The intensity is variable, but, but the pattern is there, that it's turning that, 
that light on for about the same duration each time and, and the interval between those flashes is about the same. This lovely picture is was up on our, our joint Facebook pages um, within the last week. This is from Stephen Mudge. He has taken a time exposure to where he's got all of the, the flashes that he was seeing there. And, and you can see a little bit of a pattern there. But if we look at the next one, this is the one I really want you to have a look at because this one from Steve Noble, have a look at the trace on the right-hand side. See here, this, this was a, fi a firefly just flying down here, flashing on and off. That's what it does, flash on and then a dark bit, flash on and a dark bit. And of course, the fact that when they fly, they're flashing on and off means that they are harder to catch because there's a dark bit. And a, which, what way did it go? Did it, if, if you are wanting to catch them, to maybe to take a, a photograph. What's really interesting about this, this um, particular picture, though, is this. Now, either, um, this is a picture from Steve Noble, but either Steve had an incredibly... Um, sensitive camera or if you look right in the middle at the top here at this elongate flash this firefly was flying right past the camera and if you look at it that flashing pattern looks like it's almost striped and the way i'm interpret sorry um, the way i'm interpreting that is that the that pattern is actually oscillating it's oscillating from high to low so rapidly that the camera has been able to uh, depict it, but our, our, native, our naked eyes wouldn't would ever be able to um, to identify that. We, we'd not and we'd not see that. Now I've seen this before, and this makes me wonder whether you are going to get more than one species appearing around Kyogle. Because this is this species here is Atophila lychnis, which is the Blue Mountains firefly. It was in this, these pictures are taken in the Gold Coast hinterland, and they were taken not long after this um, on this particular property. They had Atophila hinterlands appearing. That's the one that you're getting now in Kyogle, and then just after that, on exactly the same property, out comes this one. Now look at the difference between it in terms of what the thing looks like. Look at the elytra. The elytra have um, a clear, they're brown, they're dark brown, but have a clear margin and they've got stripes, long pale stripes on them. So it's a very distinctive looking species, quite, quite different. There's same sort of thing. Again, you can see the striping, the stripe pattern on the elytra very clearly. And wait. This will, my, my computer wants to talk, go faster than I want to talk. <laughs> and um, in this, again, Elytra out, this one is just about to take off. And you can see what a, an aer aerodynamic disaster this is. But, you know, they seem to manage really big hind wings, beautiful, beautiful, full, big light organs. And they're again already all set to go. Now, it's possible that there will be a lot of questions about this. What and um, what should you do when you go out at, if it's tonight? And what sort of illumination should you use? Well, I'm not going to give you advice. I am going to tell you that apart from the fact that your safety, your safety is absolutely paramount, I want to show you what I use. And how it is possible to modify this particular thing for your own use. This is a, a torch that was given to us in um, Taiwan in about 2017 when I was over there for a conference. And I asked them at the time, why are you giving us a torch which has white light? As it turns out, this one has white light, purple light, and um, a yellowish amber light. So it's getting down, amber is getting a little bit towards the red end of the spectrum. And they said because Leslie's safety was important, that they had all these people, hundreds of people visiting Taiwan at that stage, and they said it was important that you be able to see where you're going. Now, go back. Okay, 
Now, across the, the um, beam of this torch, it's about, this torch about 13 centimetres long. It's only about two centimetres across at the beam. So it has a, for me, I find that very useful. It has a very narrow beam. And it has, as I said, it has three different light sources. Um, they tell me the, the second light source is purple. And um, they tell me in Taiwan that they used to use that to check whether the notes were counterfeit. And it is actually quite useful for checking whether you've got tartar on your teeth too. Um, but you can use you can use with safety because you, you will be able to see your way around. You can use the amber light as well. But the important thing is for me is the fact that the beam is very narrow so that if you are going to go out tonight and you've just got a conventional torch, um, what you can do is you can narrow the beam of that torch. Now, quite clearly, what you choose to use is up to you, but and, and you know, and that is your that is your choice. But obviously, we don't want to have a situation where, if you understand what's happening and how very hard it is for those males to find a female, and that female must be fertilized if this life cycle is going to continue then you, you don't want to be going with a lot of light and disturbing them. Um, so, you know, if you, if you are going out and you can keep your light directed onto the ground, then, then that will be fine. You don't, you're not going to stand there and shine your light towards the fireflies. As far, as far as I'm concerned, knowledge is power. The more you understand about these things, the more you will um, know what is the right thing to do. Now, I've, I've, I'm very close to finished here, so I've only got a, a few more things to talk about. This is where fireflies are in Australia, and you may be a little surprised at that map, that mainly it's down the east coast. Um, probably down, it's Kangaroo Valley in, I, I mightn't have my dots in exactly the right place, but Kangaroo Valley, um, south of Sydney, or the uh, near Nowra, and um, they're not all exactly coastal that up around Dorigo, though you can find them on the New England Plateau there. You can find them um, in behind Brisbane in the, the Gold Coast hinterland, and you can also find them up on Lamington National Plateau. There are more, more species, lots more species in North Queensland where they're very characteristically associated with the blocks of rainforest. Um, over towards the Northern Territory and even in Western Australia, there's Western Western Australia, there's a species we know that flies around Kununurra. There's another, sorry, another species which is um, up on the Mitchell Plateau. We just had found out about that last year too. And um, I think the lowest dot there in the Northern Territory is supposed to be Catherine, which I think is possibly just a little bit out of the way. But there's, I could talk about this forever about where what species they are and where they've all come from, but we want to, to know, today we're just concentrating on Kyogle. Now, this is almost the second last thing I'm going to talk about because we all want to use Google. Google is a great source of information. If you are trying to assess the information you find on Google, about fireflies, how do you know whether it's going to be legitimate? You know, can you what can you what can you take as being reasonable assessment of the information that you find? Now, this will I hope explain it, and you may wonder why all of a sudden we're going to a map of the world. But if you look at on the right hand side, this line indicates the area that I work on. I've worked on the fireflies of this area, but I've worked on only this subfamily Lucialini. Now this subfamily is all we've got in Australia and all that we've got in uh, New Guinea. New Guinea, the Solomons, the Pacific Islands, the islands to the north, the Micronesia, the Republic of Palau, that's just Lucialini. When you get to the left and you get further over through um, Indonesia and, and into Southeast Asia, then it gets more complicated. But the thing, if we, if we want to assess information 
on Australian fireflies, you need to remember that it's only Luciolini in Australia. And no, there are no fireflies in New Zealand, in case you're wondering. Now, there's a big question mark about um, Africa because nobody's worked on the fireflies of Africa since they were very first described. And, and they were very first described anywhere from about 1880 to 1920. So, you know, that's that's a long time ago. So we we can't, we there are things we can't say about Africa. But if we go over to the Americas, most of the information you're going to get on Google um, about fireflies is going to come out of America because America has fantastic fireflies, fantastic tourist ventures. Um, everybody had fireflies in their garden as a kid. They all know about fireflies over there. They live with them. So the information is going to come out of there. And if what you have to realize only, because there's going to be some very good, very interesting information coming out of there, is that what we have in Australia, they don't have in the Americas and what they have in the Americas, we don't have here. And I think we must be just about time for questions, Susie and Ilka. Thanks so much, Lindsay. I feel all full up and really inspired. That was amazing. <laughs> I didn't realize I was gonna become, I was just sitting here thinking, maybe I'm gonna start studying fireflies. <laughs> anyway. oh, that'd be good, that'd be good. I know. Um, so I've got a couple of questions that were written here. The first one is, how long do the males live for? A um, couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Yeah, a couple of weeks. We're not we're not a hundred percent sure, but um, it um, you know they they they're only around for you're seeing them what now? You you've probably been seeing them for two weeks. So that's... I think at my yeah my place they've been around for about three weeks. I did last night. There was a bit less than there were before that, and I was wondering if what I see every night are the same ones or are they new ones emerging? Hard hard to tell. Hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think short of going out, marking each one, catching them again, yes. the next time, it, it's it's too yeah. hard to tell. Yeah. Um. So, and then the next question is, is there an evolutionary benefit to having such a long um, larva stage? Because it seems like maybe that's a bit risky. Well, first of all, we don't know with our Australian species whether they have a one-year life cycle or a two-year life cycle. Oh, okay. So, so it, let, let's let's even say that it was a one-year life cycle. Then um, we still you still find that the the life cycle and the various stages have still are still having to coincide with the seasons. So that even a one-year life cycle will still be coinciding with the the season um, that the the adults are. Uh, essentially cold-bodied creatures, so they're not going to be able to get enough energy to fly in, in at other times. They, they can't fly during winter, for example. So um, uh, I, I, that's about the best I can do there. Thank you. Um, this isn't a question, but where am I reading? Um, Stephen Mudge, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, says he just wanted to let you know that he thinks he has some recent examples of that oscillating flash pattern. He's going oh, to send them to you. Yeah, because he was the one. I used his slide there. And, yeah. and I, either, I, I thought, now, am I right? Is that pattern actually oscillating or has he got the most super camera? You know, and and I think, no, no, I think, I think it is an oscillating camera and, and tell him I'd be really interested to see. I think he's listening, so he should have heard that. Yes. So okay. he's going to be in contact Thank with you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> yes, no worries. Um, and Susie asked if you've heard um, any or many First Nation stories about fireflies. No, no, I've never heard any. And I noticed that that was a question, wasn't it, on on the, your site just in the last week or so. So, no, yeah. I don't know. 
Not even from when you've been over in other parts in Asia? Have you heard? Oh, any... oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, Japan, for example. Japan is, is Japan is firefly heaven in terms yeah. of, you know, the, the amount of time that they have been looking at fireflies, the, the how deeply ingrained it is in their culture. But um, not, not, not for our own, not, not for Australia. Yeah. Um, what can we do to conserve the habitat? Well, this might be a funny answer, but if they are, um, if they're there now, don't do anything. <laughs> but, but if the habitat is all right for them, Leave it alone. Now, but then what you've got to try and do is make sure that nobody else comes along. There's a classic example, I think, in um, the Gold Coast hinterland where this guy had a, um, a road leading up to his property and there was a lot of long grass on the side of the road and, and Atafellus hinterlands, your, your species at the moment, was displaying along the road. It was fantastic um, display along the side of the road. Then they came along and mowed it. So if you've got if you've got them, try to see what you can do to ensure that the habitat is left alone. Now, you know, one of the things that has been suggested on one of the overseas sites was that they um, did um, they put up signs, and the signs was you know fireflies yeah. are breeding here, and and this is mm. the thing that we forget, you know, that it's like when when the wattle have finished. Um, um flowering we forget that they're wattle again don't we until they come out again you know so mm, um, yeah I think, I think it's a it's a an issue we we've only got five minutes left there's one more question um how do you think that the last couple of years of rain has been helpful for the populations well what what is depending now let, let's let's just assume that it's a one year life cycle well then what we what we need to do is look back at what was happening a year be, a year ago so what what were the conditions like then not 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 what's been happening so much in between times but what were the conditions mm. like then and and were there a lot of fireflies then um i would say that rain has uh, you know in a general sense, yes, of course it's got to help the population, as long as, of course, it's not washing them away. When you have something like a lava, which can be, um, you know, um, washed away by, by water, or a flightless female, which has no control over where she's going, then, you know, it, it is yeah, it could be a, a real problem. I think Susie wants to do something there, doesn't she? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we have some evaluation questions. If people would like to just respond in the chat, that would be fantastic. Or you can answer on our Facebook page as well. It'll really help because um, this project's been is uh, has been funded with a grant, and so we need to reply. And the more we reply, the more grants we can get to keep doing cool things like this, which would be awesome. <laughs> I just yeah, I was just thinking because I oh sorry, Susie, you go. Yeah, and it's just particularly about learning new skills. If we can capture anything from you about learning new skills, yep, and a yes is a fine response. Um, that just helps us. Thank you. I was just going to, just before I say thank you, Leslie, because, I mean, it, you've been so generous with your time and with your knowledge, and um, it, it's a real gift that you're sharing decades of research and experience and we're really grateful thank you so much um i was just thinking about my place because i've had so many fireflies and i live quite on the edge of gullies but i also have a lot of paddy melons so i hear them stomp 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 stomping around at night time so i was just thinking in terms of how the fireflies navigate all of the stomping creatures in the bush i guess they must have an evolutionary either their numbers or something that, I mean, that they're going to be trodden on by some other creatures. So it's, oh, just, they, it's they just an interesting thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, of, one of the problems that, that you've got to realise is that most of the males you see out there are going to die, are, are going to die at, and, and are not going to achieve finding a female. So, you know, it, it's, it's the same with any, anything in, in nature that huge numbers are produced, very few survive. 
Thank you so much. Are there, is there, we've got two minutes left. I don't know if there were any other questions or if anybody else can um, write down in, in the chat what they may have learnt during, during this presentation. But I just want to say, again say thanks so much, Leslie. Really grateful. It's been really great to have you um, do this presentation. And maybe next year we might be able to get you up to come and see the fireflies up here. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. There's, um, Holly's saying a big thank you too. There's mm. there's thank yous in them. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I did want to let this group know is um, if you're not already, please join the Kyogle Flyerflies Facebook page um, and that we will have a pop-up and, and a pop-up Firefly event. Well, I think we, we were going to try and have one today, but um, it's not we're not seeing them in town where we were hoping to see them, where it was an easy, accessible, safe spot to get people um, together. So we're going to go for another time, which will be the 30th of September. But we may have to rethink the venue, Ilka, if we're still not seeing them there by then. We might have to just use a bit of a um, yeah, a citizens chat um, about where we might be able to have that yeah. um, activity happen. Hmm. Well, thank you, Leslie. Okay. Mm. See you guys. Thank you so much, Leslie, and thank you everybody for joining. And we'll work out a way to get it online so that you can share it with anybody that um, you think might be interested. And we're hoping this is going to be a legacy project as well, so that um, something around fireflies every year is continued, um, so that we can contribute to the citizen science around these beautiful um, creatures. And we really thank you, Leslie, for the dedication that you've shown, um, yeah, these insects over your life. It's, um, it's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks.